Hey friends, this is Michael Bohm with Youth Apologetics Train. Ow. Training. Hey, I just stubbed my toe. Hey friends, this is Michael Bohm with Youth Apologetics Training. Today we're going to start a new series. We're going to be talking about do you need to be baptized in order to be saved? Is that an absolute necessity? As in, if you didn't get baptized, but you went your whole life, or you trusted in Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, you repented of your sins and trusted in Christ, and then you die, uh, according to some people's beliefs, that's not good enough, you're going to hell. All right? They believe that you absolutely must be baptized in order to be saved. Uh, if you don't, be, if you're not baptized, you're not saved. Okay, we're going to talk about that. Is that biblical? Uh, well, no, it's not. It's definitely not. And we're going to look at that. So we're going to look at uh, some of the groups that believe this. We're also going to be looking at many different arguments showing that this is false. And I'm going to hit it pretty hard right away uh, because then following those uh, pretty solid arguments showing that we do not have to be baptized to be saved, we're going to then look at a whole mess of scriptures that are used to support this doctrine that you must be baptized to be saved. And I want to lay a good a groundwork for uh, reasons why you don't need to be baptized to be saved. That way it, it makes more sense when you look at these scriptures in their proper context and you understand biblically <laughs> that salvation is based on, well, it's by grace, through faith. It's not of ourselves. It's not some work we can do. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any of us should boast. I started by paraphrasing and ended by quoting. That's a mess. <laughs> anyway, uh, let's start by looking at a few groups that actually do believe this. One of the most popular groups that every single one of my listeners know about is the Roman Catholics. They believe that you absolutely must be baptized to be saved. And interestingly enough, the Roman Catholic Church believes in you must do a whole lot of things to be saved. And the, I was going to say the funny thing. The not so funny thing is their belief on what it is or what it takes to be saved, it oscillates, it changes, it morphs, and it morphs so rapidly that it's hard to really keep a, a, a good bead on what exactly is going on. How do you get saved? If you read the Catechism, it says one thing. If you look at the Council of Trent, it says that if you're not part of the Catholic Church, you're anathema, you're cursed, you're not even going to be saved no matter what. So if you're reading the Bible and you're not part of the Catholic Church, you're not saved according to the Council of Trent. If you believe in salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, you're accursed, according to the Council of Trent. You look at the Catechism of the Catholic Church, and it says that you're saved through observing all these different sacraments, the seven sacraments, building up a treasury of merit to escape purgatory, um, all of these things. Okay, it's very works-based. But then you start listening to some of the quotes by uh, uh, John Paul II, our, our, one of our last popes, uh, <laughs> And and then even some by Pope Benedict, the just previously Pope who just stepped down, you hear a lot of various things to suggest that, well, it's a lot looser than that. And even the Mormons, um, the Mormons, yeah, the Mormons too, sorry. Anyway, the Roman Catholic Church, with all their strange beliefs, do believe that you must be baptized in order to be saved. Some other groups would be uh, your Church of Christ uh, group of churches, or denomination, if you will, and also the International Church of Christ. And they just, the International Church of Christ, I've heard of them before a few times, but they just came up on the radar a little bit more solidly recently. Thanks, Clark. Uh, <laughs> one of my listeners contacted me and started uh, talking about these guys, and I started looking into them. And they really do have some traits about them that seem cultic. But I think I need to study some more. I've looked at them for quite some time now over the last couple of weeks, really looking in depth. And then I found out towards the end of studying them that around, well, around 2002, their founder, Kip McKeon, again, this is the International Churches of Christ, stepped down. And the church, this organization has gone through 
many changes. They're strong cult-like control, mind control type abuse tactics that they were putting on their people, uh, their hierarchy of their, their movement. The whole thing broke down. And now the, the authority resides in the local churches instead of this top-down pyramid Amway scheme that was previously happening. And so now it's a little bit elusive as to what groups have reformed their faith and have gone back to something more biblical and which ones are still holding on to the Kit McKeon, put you in a headlock and make you go out and evangelize the world tactics. <laughs> uh, I'll probably do a series on these guys in, in the future, but I think I need to nail down where they're at. If you guys have some more uh, inside information, if some of you have more intimate knowledge of these groups from the inside, I'd love to hear about it. Uh, but anyway, the Church of Christ is interesting. They believe that you must be baptized to be saved. Uh, they're generally really good people, and I, I have no doubt that most of them are probably saved, okay? Really good people. I know one personally. He might even be listening right now. Um, <laughs> uh, but they also, interestingly enough, some of you might be shocked by this, they also believe that you shouldn't be using instruments in worship, uh, you really should be singing a cappella. Uh, it's fine by me, as long as, it, you know, there are some, okay, some, hear me out, some that actually believe that if you use instruments in church, well, that's somewhat of a salvation issue that, you know, so anyway, most of them don't go that far. They just kind of frown on people that use instruments. They generally, they'll argue that since instruments are not talked about in the New Testament, they're not for the New Testament age. And so then, then you have this International Church of Christ that is in, in the Church of Christ movement. It would be a cult spinoff, okay? Uh, but like I said, there's been some uniting of these two movements. And uh, Kit McKeon, after he left in 2002, he did start some other church movement. And so, good grief, it, it's kind of a mess. But uh, anyway... I'm claiming that you don't need to be baptized in order to be saved. Uh, in other words, baptism does not precede salvation. It is what follows salvation because it's commanded, right? You get saved, you need to get baptized. You need to get immersed. Uh, well, let's look at some passages. Let's get into the Bible here. Let's start this off with a bang. And look at some a long passage in Acts chapter 15 and cross-reference it with a few other scriptures. And right off the bat, friends, right off the bat, uh, you're going to see a pretty strong case that uh, you don't need to get baptized in order to be saved. You get baptized because you are saved. Just like you don't do good works to be saved, you do good works because you are saved. All right, And just as a reminder, if you had to be baptized in order to be saved, baptism preceding salvation, then we should find many clear and plain warnings to all those who would read them in the Bible that if you were not baptized, you were not saved. You should find clear warnings as in, you know, look, take heed, behold, friends, wake up. You must be baptized in order to be saved. If you don't get baptized, you are not one of God's, you know. Those who don't get baptized will go to hell, those kind of type things, okay? All right, maybe that would be found in the Mike translation. But uh, anyway, <laughs> you get what I'm saying? You should find many, plain and clear. We're talking about a doctrine that supposedly will send you to hell, all right? Now, God wouldn't take that lightly. If God was serious about this, let's get to this ch Acts chapter 15. I want to show you this, because I think this makes it abundantly clear that baptism does not proceed salvation. It is what results from salvation. Uh, okay, so we have verse 1, And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and, and, and said, Except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. All right, this sounds just like unless you're baptized, you cannot be saved, right? This would be a great time for the apostles uh, to, to start talking about this, right? 
All right, so in verse 2, when therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, in other words, they threw down, (laughs) they had a big argument, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about this question. Verse 3, and being brought on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenice and Samaria, declaring the conversion of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy unto all brethren. And when they were coming to Jerusalem, they were received of the church and of the apostles and elders, and they declared all the things that God had done with them. But there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees, which believed, saying that it was needful. Okay, so these are believers, right? Which believed, saying that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. And the apostles and the elders came together to consider this matter. And when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, ye know that a good while ago God made choice among us and the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us, and put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now, what Peter's saying is, I went to some Gentiles' house, okay, and uh, you remember the story, guys? Cornelius, and we're going to read this here in a minute, uh, but it was in Acts chapter 10, verses 44 through 47, we have... Peter being led to this Cornelius' house. And God had made it clear to Peter that these Gentiles were being made clean. He goes to their house, and uh, they get saved. And they didn't get baptized. Oops. And they didn't get circumcised. And so Peter's bringing this up. He's like, look, guys, you know, I went over there, and these Gentiles... They got saved. They received the Holy Ghost. They started speaking in tongues. All you oneness Pentecostals, (laughs) they started speaking in tongues. And so Peter's making it clear to them, look, uh, these Gentiles got saved without being circumcised. And it was clear that God had saved them. It happened right in front of us. Uh, And so let's look at that really quick, because there's an interesting thing that happens here. Uh, So in Acts chapter 10, verses 44 through 47, verse 44, while Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all of them which heard the word, and they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify a God. Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? All right, guys, did did you see what just happened there? These Gentiles received the Holy Ghost, started speaking in tongues before they got baptized. Before. Now, friends, the Holy Spirit is our earnest, uh, the earnest of our inheritance as Believers. In other words, it's, it's that sign that God gives us, that down payment, that sign that we are saved, that we're one of his. That, look, in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, in whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed. All right, so they're saved. After that ye believed, ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise which is the earnest of our inheritance, until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. You see what that is? The Holy Spirit's like that down payment uh, on the purchase of us, our redemption. All right? And so these Gentiles got that down payment. They got that earnest, the Holy Spirit, the proof of their salvation before they were baptized. Now, guys, I have heard people try to explain this verse away and say, well, God was doing this or God was doing that. But guys, again, if God is truly saying to us that you have to be baptized or you're not saved. In other words, if you don't get dunked in water, you're going to hell. If that's what he's saying, 
then why in the world would God allow this to happen in Acts chapter 10? Why did God give the Holy Spirit the proof of their salvation to these people before they got saved if, if baptism is that thing that precedes salvation? You see what I'm saying? You're getting the cart before the horse? Okay, so let's go back to this Acts chapter 15, okay? I just wanted to explain what Peter's talking about because they're having this big dispute about being circumcised and if you're not circumcised, you're not saved. And Peter's saying, no, no, God gave them the Holy Ghost right in front of me. God showed me that these Gentiles were his and they weren't, they, they had not been circumcised. All right, and they received that earnest of the inheritance. Okay, so in verse 10, moving on here. Now, therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved, even as they. Then all the multitude kept silent and gave out... <coughs> And gave audience to Barnabas and Paul, declaring what miracles and wonders God had wrought among the Gentiles by them. And after they had held their peace, James answering, answered, saying, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. Simeon, that's Peter, Simeon hath declared how God at first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And to this agree the words of the prophets, as it's written, after this I will return. And I will build again the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. And I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up, that the residue of men might seek after the Lord and all the Gentiles, upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth all these things. Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. Wherefore, wherefore my sentence is that we trouble not them which from among the Gentiles are turned to God, but that we write unto them that they abstain from pollutions of idols and from fornication and from things strangled from blood. For Moses of old hath in every city them that preach him, being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day, then pleased at the apostle and elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, name, namely Judas surnamed Barsabbas and Silas, chief men among the brethren. And they wrote letters of them after this manner. The apostles and elders and brethren send greeting unto the brethren, which are of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia. For as much as we, as we have heard that certain which went out from us have troubled you with words, subverting your soul, saying, ye must be circumcised, and keep the law to whom we gave no such commandment. It seemed good unto us, being assembled with one accord, to send chosen men unto you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men that have hazarded their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have sent therefore Judas and Silas, who shall also tell you the same things by mouth. For it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things that ye abstain from meats offered to idols, and from blood, and from things strangled, and from fornication, from which, if ye keep yourselves, ye you shall do well. Fare ye well. All right. Guys, this would have been, I know that was a long passage, this would have been a perfect time for them during this meeting to say, no, you don't have to be circumcised, but you do need to be baptized. But you don't see that anywhere. Now, I know this is an argument from silence. But guys, of all the places in the Bible, this is where you would expect it to happen. All right, this big throwdown, this big argument, disputation between the Pharisees, who were believers, these, these particular Pharisees, and the apostles. You know, why aren't your, some of the Gentiles getting circumcised? They have to be circumcised in order to be saved. If you don't get circumcised... You cannot be saved. And then we have Peter, who jumps into this argument and says, Hey, look, I went to these Gentiles' house, and I preached to them. And when they heard the words, they heard the gospel, if you will, the Holy Spirit fell on them, 
And they started speaking in tongues. Oh, and by the way, then they were baptized. All right, and then we go on and we find that they send out this command through Silas and Barsabbas. And these guys go out bringing one message, and they're not trying to burden the new Gentile believers. They're not trying to burden anybody, but they just say, look, abstain from the offered idols, which was a big deal back then because there were so many temples offering up uh, sacrifices to pagan gods, okay? And then they had such an abundance, a surplus of, of meat that these pagan priests couldn't use that they would bring it outside and sell it in the marketplace at Walmart prices. <laughs> All right? So they had these cheap prices, and uh, many believers were going out and buying these meats. And the meats themselves weren't going to send you to hell. The meats weren't going to curse you, but it was causing people to stumble. All right? So abstain from meats offered to idols and from blood and from things strangled and from fornication, duh, yeah, from which, if you keep yourselves, you shall do well. And that was the message. Nothing about baptism. Yes, that's an argument from silence, partly, but the, the, the silence is deafening. All right? And by the way, again, all the Gentiles received the Holy Spirit. In Cornelius' house, all the Gentiles received the Holy Spirit before they were baptized. And again, the Holy Spirit is that down payment, that proof that you are saved. All right, I'm going to stop right there. Friends, if you like this type of podcast, you like this type of content, apologetics, cult research, worldviews, creation, evolution, Bible difficulties, and the like, you ought to come out to my website, youthapologeticstraining.com, and click on the podcast archive link. And there you'll find somewhere around 360 episodes, and I'm adding to them every day. So, yeah, come and check that out. Everything's free. Everything is for you guys. Also, if you want to chat, you can catch me on Google+, Facebook, and Twitter. Uh, And with that, friends, I love you guys, and I'll see you tomorrow.